All right, so welcome everyone to this event for World Diabetes Day. We're a few days early, but we wanted to get it in uh, on the Friday to give people a chance to know what the resources that Defining Moments Canada is presenting uh, and to have access to kind of this information before uh, what we'll call Diabetes Week coming up next week. Uh, on November 14th, World Diabetes Day coincides with Sir Frederick Banton's birthday. Uh, and this year being the centenary of the discovery of insulin, uh, it's a big one. Uh, us at Defining Moments Canada, we've put together a collection of resources. We've been working on a commemorative project uh, for some time now. So the, the, the website and the resources and the project is, is very far along. Uh, and we wanted to put this little event together to promote those resources, to show people what's out there, uh, to show people what they can use, teachers, uh, what kind of resources they can bring into their classrooms, and really just anyone who's interested in the story of insulin, the story of the discovery of insulin, its lasting legacy, uh, what it means, and how this story can help us understand certain things from the past and certain things from today. So we wanted to, to kind of present that. Uh, we've got a few panelists with us uh, to explain different, different aspects of this uh, story. Uh, first, we'll talk to Vincent Sabourin, who's a filmmaker, uh, a recent graduate of Algonquin College in the, the film creation department. I'm sorry, Vincent, I don't know the exact name of your program. I should have written that down before. Um, and Vincent's been working with us to create a series of insulin video profiles. Um, so Vincent, welcome. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to uh, talk about this very important project. All right. So you, uh, just to give us an idea, could you talk to us a bit about what this insulin video profile series is and, and, and how it's kind of maybe not came to be, but how it evolved as you were doing it? Yeah, I mean, the idea was to present people with different perspectives, uh, different life experiences of people who have been living um, with with diabetes and who are insulin dependent, right? People whose lives have been impacted by insulin in some way, shape or form. And uh, I myself am type one diabetic. I'm uh, 29 years old and I was diagnosed when I was 25. So uh, um, relatively late in my life so far. Um, so it was something incredibly new to me, um, but this, project as a whole was to gain different perspectives and see how different people live through the reality of being insulin dependent. And um, I will say it's been a very enriching and uh, experience to not only be a filmmaker during this, uh, this project and to, you know, firsthand hear these stories, but to also be able to um, sympathize with a lot of them being a type one diabetic as well. So you have your own story and your own kind of uh, journey with insulin, which you actually presented in, in the first of this uh, video profile series. Can you maybe talk about how hearing these different stories and telling these different stories maybe impacted your own relationship with insulin or your own understanding of what it is? I mean, it's, it's changed. Well, it hasn't changed, but it was definitely um, put into check a little bit is how I like to put it. Like, uh, for those who have watched the video, um, my relationship with insulin is, for the most part, a positive one in that, you know, I, I found that uh, I took my health a lot more seriously after my diagnosis, as all diabetics should. Um, you know, I kind of started exercising a lot more. And in my video, I say that it's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me is, you know, becoming diabetic. And this tool allows me to kind of control my life. And it's with hindsight, it's but by listening to other stories that I realized that my comments to a certain degree are kind of flippant, right? Because the realities for different people are so varied. Um, as an example, the second video that we did was about um, Talia, who was diagnosed when she was uh, one, a, a, year, a year old. She was a year and a half old when she was diagnosed. So like my life experience and hers going forward are going to be completely different in that, you know, it's... Um, for me, it was more of a solo effort to come to grips with the fact that I was diabetic and insulin dependent. But for her, it's, it's this entire support group that um, has to rally behind her because she's so young. She can't do it on her own. Um, so the video focuses really a lot on the mother um, and she talks about how hard it is and um, how scary it is and 
like, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's very scary to think about myself, you know, what would I have, what would I have been like as a one and a half year old being diagnosed with diabetes? Like how would my parents have reacted? Like our lives would have been completely different. Um, so it's really, um, it was really great to hear all those different stories because I don't know that my perception of insulin has changed for me, but I, I, I certainly don't take it for granted as much anymore. That's for true. That's uh, that's for sure. You get the sense in, in the video series you've created that there's people of different ages and it's kind of, we're talking to Talia, who I think is two at the time of the video. There's, uh, you know, a nine-year-old, there's an 18-year-old, there's uh, yourself who's in your late 20s. We're talking to a young mother. Um, you kind of get the sense that everyone's experience with insulin is different, but also that if we did a profile of these people at different times in their lives, if we did a follow-up profile of Talia in 10 years, or if we did a profile of yourself 10 years ago, that the story would be very different. Um, can you maybe speak this to the sense of kind of the evolving relationship with insulin that one would have through time, depending on uh, realities and what they're going through? Do you mean through me specifically or for the other? Just kind of, video you know, subjects that, as well? I think one thing that's interesting about your series is how you capture different periods in people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. And how maybe you're able to tell the story of insulin through multiple people of different ages. Um, I, maybe the question's not really going anywhere. I just find that to be an interesting uh, aspect and I'm wondering if you could speak to it a little bit. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the subjects that we found, not to categorize them just as subjects, they are people, but they represent different uh, facets of, of, of life, right? Like, um, I feel like I, I have known people in my life who have been diabetic since a young age and, um, going through adolescence, your body goes through so many changes and with being diabetic and being insulin dependent, you, you are a, you're forced to kind of in, uh, create a habit for yourself, yeah, a routine that you kind of need to follow, but all that gets thrown out of whack with changes. Uh, if you, if you even just like take up a sport, you have to like really change your routine. Um, me being diagnosed when I was 25, I kind of was already kind of set in my ways. I did change my ways, but the transition from being non-diabetic to diabetic, for the most part, wasn't earth shattering. Uh, but for someone who's much younger, um, um, I like to think about Vanessa's example in particular. You know, she was nine years old, I believe. No, she was, she was like about five years old. Like, how do you communicate that to your parents? You know, you don't really know um, how to really kind of understand uh, what's going on. And it's like a burden on the parents almost to a certain extent to, to lead their children through that. Um, so that's one side of it. And then we look at Emily, who's uh, a mother who's had diabetes since she was a child herself, but um, isn't letting um, these so-called challenges stop her from living her life. Um, one of the questions that we ask her is, um, cause she is also, um, she has given birth. Uh, she, she was pregnant at the time of our video, but I asked her if being diabetic was at all a factor in her decision to have children because you can transmit it. It's, it's a genetic disease. And she said, no, you know, it's, it's not something I've thought about whenever I wanted to have children. I just wanted children. And uh, that's that. But that's something that I think about greatly um, is passing that on to, a, to my child. Um, I think it's, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, depending on your age, um, you'll deal with it very differently. And, and just um, not even just your age, but also your, your socioeconomic background, like sometimes insulin isn't very accessible to you. Um, and I think that's a reality that we also need to kind of think about and um, acknowledge. Um, yeah. I think, you know, absolutely. I think, you know, you're really hitting on it that insulin will react differently with different people. You'll, you'll be able to find insulin differently. Uh, and depending on uh, where you are in life, your, your relationship with insulin will be different. Um, I, I, your camera is a bit frozen for me, but I'm still speaking as though you can still hear me. We'll see if that's accurate. No? Or maybe my internet's bad. No, Anna and Scott are was smiling, so I think it's, it's maybe more of my son. 
Um, well, I'll, I'll ask a long form question and he'll have to improvise when he comes back in to pretend he heard it. Um, but, you know, Vaisal, you're speaking of uh, insulin basically affecting people differently, but also depending on your social economic uh, status, whether you can find insulin. Um, this last video of the insulin profile series, um, which we're premiering in a, a few minutes here, showcases a young teenager who uh, developed an allergy to insulin. Uh, so her relationship with insulin dramatically changed. Um, could you, if I saw maybe set up this video, kind of tell us about the video that we're about to watch to tell us how, um, why it's the last one in the series and how it's really showcasing a unique experience with, with uh, insulin. Sure. Um, for the four videos that we kind of start with me, there's Talia, Vanessa, and there's Emily. Uh, these are stories of people who uh, have diabetes and are insulin dependent. And um, one of the questions that we ask at the end of each video is, if you could speak to Dr. Banting right now, what would you tell him? And for the, I mean, for the greater part, everything is just very positive. It's like, thank you messages. But what's really interesting about Sasha's story is that insulin for her is almost not enough for her being allergic to the to the thing that is keeping her alive um we kind of wanted to end on this ambiguous question of what next what do we do next um and i don't want to reveal too much but um uh, i think it's really important to share this story of hers where um it's not all sunshine and rainbows you know things can be really hard and um for people who are type 1 diabetic Having insulin sometimes is, is a solution, but it's a temporary one. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to watching it. I haven't watched the full version yet since it's been fully done. So I'm looking forward to putting it on, which I'll do now. Um, this video tells the story of Sasha. She's, uh, I believe she's 18 or 19. And she is from uh, Eastern Ontario, from Plantagenet. Uh, she oh, from is Alfred. From Alfred, sorry. And yeah. you're actually from right near there too. So this video series is kind of yeah. really speaking into your into your wheelhouse in that it speaks yeah. to you. Sorry, I, I, uh, when my connection lost there, broke up, uh, did you talk about her, her story or is that what you wanted me to do? I was kind of asking you to throw to it and you did. You kind of, I think you teased okay. it nicely. So uh, let's put the video on it. And if you have any kind of things you want to say to kind of tie the knots afterwards, uh, you're welcome to, to speak again. Uh, this video, the main language that Sasha speaks in the video is French, uh, but it is all subtitled. So I think it will have, uh, sorry, I'm sharing screen. I can't do things at once. I can't speak and share a screen at the same time. Let's put the video on and we'll, we'll see if we have any more comments afterwards. Bonjour, je m'appelle Sacha Cardinal, je suis diabétique type 1 depuis l'âge de 2 ans. Ma relation avec l'insuline en grandissant, c'était, ben, tu sais, pour moi, c'est quelque chose qui me gardait en vie. Puis ça a vraiment tout le temps été quelque chose, tu sais, pour moi, c'est comme quelque chose que j'appréciais parce que dans ma tête, je suis comme, OK, je suis capable de vivre normal comme toutes les autres grâce à ce médicament-là, tu sais, dans le fond. Hein. Mon enfance, adolescence a été différente à cause du diabète, je suis pas incertaine. Tu sais, dans le fond, Tu rentres surtout dans un petit village comme le mien. Tu rentres à l'école, puis tout le monde est juste normal. Puis toi, tu rentres là, puis tu as quelque chose sur toi. Il faut que tu prennes les sujets avant de manger, puis tout ça. C'est sûr que les gens remarquent ce genre de choses, surtout quand dans une classe pleine, tu es comme peut-être 15. Tu es haut de sucre, puis tu es bas de sucre. Ça, comme ça l'affecte tout le temps. Puis dans le fond, genre, comme tu sais, quand je suis basse, dans le fond, je, je me sens tellement comme en pas engourdi, mais comme, tu sais, mes jambes tremblent, je vais pleurer à tout, 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 tout. comme je deviens super émotionnelle, puis tout ça. Tandis que quand on sait qu'il est haut, tu sais, comme, ça peut affecter aussi, selon moi, les relations que tu as avec les gens, parce que je deviens tellement agressive 
puis je suis juste comme scénaire avec tout quand mon sucre est haut. Puis c'est comme, tu sais, j'ai soif. Puis c'est comme, OK, ben on va aller aux salles de bain, mettons, cinq fois dans une heure. T'sais, puis c'est tout le temps comme... Les gens, il faut qu'ils s'adaptent à ça aussi. L'été de la huitième à la neuvième année, c'est vraiment là que j'ai vu, comme j'ai commencé à avoir une réaction négative, pas mal à l'insuline. Quand que, je me souviens, j'avais parlé avec une de mes amies, puis c'est ça, j'y parlais, puis je disais, oh my God, vraiment, comme ça me fait mal quand je donne l'insuline. Comme quand j'étais jeune, il n'y avait pas ça, tu sais, comme c'est comme toi, tu le tues, puis c'est ça, il était comme non, comme il n'y a pas personne qui, que, que ça fait si mal que ça quand tu te donnes l'insuline. Puis c'est de là maintenant qu'on sait que j'ai une allergie type 4 à l'insuline. Dans le fond, c'est de différents types d'allergies. Tu sais, as type 1 qui est comme tes yeux épiques, tu as ta gorge, puis tout ça. Tu sais, les allergies saisonnières souvent vont être type 1. Tandis que type 4, c'est vraiment sous la couche de ta peau, où c'est que les T-cells, ils sont. C'est une allergie souvent qui est très compliquée, euh, je te dirais, à guérir d'une façon. Ou souvent, ils vont juste enlever le médicament que tu es supposé te donner qui, fa... qui réagit, mais tu sais, dans le fond, moi, je peux pas enlever l'insuline de... dans mon corps parce que si je l'enlève, je meurs, tu sais. Euh, donc, dans le fond, c'est moi qui ai vraiment pinpoint le problème parce que je te dirais, pour un bon deux ans, il n'y avait pas personne qui me croyait. Euh, puis, tu sais, dans le fond, tu sais, je suis une personne sur trois dans le monde, fait que je peux pas blâmer vraiment le médecin de penser que c'était pas vrai. Eux autres, ils étaient, dans le fond, ils disaient que je donnais l'insuline à la même place à chaque fois. Puis, euh, c'est après, je te dirais, euh, en 2020, non, oui, avant le COVID, euh, en février, j'ai rentré à l'urgence en DK, sur kiloacidosis, dans le fond. Mon sucre était beaucoup, beaucoup trop élevé. Euh, puis, dans le fond, c'est là qu'ils ont réalisé, OK, dans le fond, elle, elle reçoit vraiment pas l'insuline à travers sa peau. Puis, il y a vraiment une réaction, il y a vraiment quelque chose qui se passe. Fait que là, de là, ils ont commencé à faire les tests, puis c'est un allergiste, Dr. Byrne de Chio. Euh, on a fait, dans le fond, un test qu'ils ont injecté les euh, préservatifs de l'insuline, puis ils ont, ils ont été capables de trouver aussi une pharmacie qui séparait tout ça. Puis ils ont séparé l'insuline complètement des, comme, tu sais, Humalor, puis tout ça, c'est la composante insuline, ils l'ont séparé, puis ils ont injecté elle, puis c'est à elle que j'ai vraiment réagi le plus. Je te dis, il n'y a pas personne qui savait quoi faire. Ce n'est pas quelque chose que tu vois tous les jours. Puis de là, dans le fond, on était comme, OK, mais c'est quoi qu'on fait? Parce que tu ne peux pas juste trouver une insuline, dans le fond, qui n'a pas d'insuline dedans. Puis il euh, n'y avait, avait pas de solution. Ça, ça a pris, je, pense, je te dirais, deux mois avant qu'ils pensent à quelque chose. Puis là, de là, on a pensé à qu ce qu'ils appellent la « desensitization ». Fait qu'ils t'injectent un petit montant d'insuline dans ton corps par heure pour essayer de reprogrammer dans le fond ton corps puis de montrer que c'est pas quelque chose qui peut pas être dans ton corps puis c'est pas quelque chose que tu peux rejeter ou c'est pas quelque chose qui est dangereux pour toi, mais ça n'a pas fonctionné. Mon quotidien a vraiment été chamboulé, tu sais, ça... C'était un point aussi, tu sais, mon sucre, encore une fois, ça revient vraiment au sucre. Le, mon sucre était tellement haut que je fais quasiment même pas parler avec mes amis parce que tout ce qu'ils me disaient m'irritait. Puis j'ai perdu, beaucoup, perdu beaucoup de gens autour de moi à cause de ces choses, de, de toute cette allergie-là. Euh, puis ensuite de ça, j'étais tellement en douleur. Fait qu'avoir ton sucre qui est haut, t'es déjà irritable. J'étais en douleur, ça n'avait pas d'allure. Fait que de là non plus, j'étais encore plus irritable que normal. Puis euh, après ça, tu sais, j'ai passé un cinq mois à l'hôpital pendant ma... Senior year. Tu sais, oui, il y avait le COVID puis tout ça, mais c'est quand même une année, selon moi, qui était supposée être le fun, que c'était supposé être... C'est ta dernière année, tu fais ce que tu veux, tu sais. Puis, je l'ai passé assis dans un lit d'hôpital à ne pas pouvoir sortir, pas pouvoir voir mes amis non plus. Puis, avec le COVID, il n'y a pas personne qui pouvait venir visiter non plus. Mais ma relation avec l'insuline a changé depuis le jour J, tu sais, comme on l'appelle. Um, c'était venu à un point où c'est que je détestais l'insuline. Tu sais, c'est quelque chose qui était supposé me garder en vie, mais qu'en même temps, il me me tuait, si ça a fait du sens. Fait que c'était un point aussi que j'étais comme, mais pourquoi que l'insuline existe? C'est pourquoi que, pourquoi j'ai besoin de la prendre si ça fait rien? Puis ça fait juste plus me faire mal que rien d'autre, tu sais. Fait que ça a vraiment passé, tu d'un jour à l'autre, c'est, t'es en amour par-dessus la tête avec cette chose-là qui te garde en vie. Puis le lendemain, tu sais, tu veux juste, t'en veux plus, tu le détestes, tu veux rien savoir de ça, tu sais. J'ai ouais, eu un moment où, que, dans le fond, j'ai euh, 
arrêter complètement de prendre l'insuline. C'était soit ça ou j'arrêtais de manger aussi. Parce que j'étais comme, ben si je mange pas, mon sucre, le... dans le fond, il va rester bas, supposé, mais tu sais, pas... on sait tous que c'est pas comme ça que ça marche. Puis j'étais comme, si je mange pas, j'ai pas besoin de donner l'insuline non plus. Puis là, c'était un point aussi que j'avais tellement faim, fait que là, je mangeais, mais j'étais comme, moi, je me donne pas l'insuline. Que je la donne, que je la donne pas, mon sucre va monter. Euh, mon corps il a vraiment mal réagi parce que, tu sais, on sait tout, si tu manges pas, tu sais, t'as pas d'énergie, t'as pas rien. Euh, C'était rendu que, comme, tu sais, j'étais quasiment une mort vivante. Puis après ça, quand que je mangeais, puis que je n'avais pas l'insuline, de là, euh, ben dans le fond, tu sais, j'ai rentré à l'hôpital en février. Fait que euh, je pense à décrire un peu comment que mon corps a réagi à ça, là. Euh, la prochaine étape. Ils ont essayé les stéroïdes, mais les stéroïdes font monter ton sucre extrêmement beaucoup. Fait que dans le fond, il fallait que je donne beaucoup plus d'insuline encore. Fait que là, de là, c'est que ça recommençait une réaction parce qu'il y avait tellement d'insuline qui était donnée. Fait que là, il fallait monter les stéroïdes, vice-versa. C'était un cercle vicieux. Fait que, on a vu que ça ne fonctionnait pas. Euh, ils m'ont mis sur des euh, immunosuppresseurs, dans le fond, pour voir si mon corps était pour... Euh, ralentir assez sur ça afin que l'insuline puisse être absorbée. Encore une fois, ça n'a pas fonctionné. Fait que là, de là, on attendait une réponse euh, d'une procédure qui était faite en France. Puis, euh, j'étais supposée de partir pour la France euh, plus tard. Puis, en fait, on a trouvé euh, la personne qui a inventé euh, le remède, dans le fond. Euh, il venait de l'Allemagne, puis il a offert que lui vienne ici à la place pour montrer aussi à un surgeon d'ici. Au moins, s'il y a quelque chose qui arrive, il y a quelqu'un ici aussi pour le faire, puis euh, figurer, dans le fond, tout ça. Fait que de là, j'ai eu le Diaport système qui a été installé euh, le 17 juin 2021, ouais. euh, Dans le fond, le Diaport, c'est euh, une pompe, je dirais quasiment comme les autres, mais il n'y a pas un cathéter, c'est comme une petite, euh, moi je l'appelle une bolt, qui rentre dans, dans ton abdomen, puis après ça, il y a un long cathéter qui va se rendre dans les liquides du corps. Puis c'est de là que l'insuline va être donnée pour passer les couches sucutanées, où c'est que, dans le fond, l'allergie type 4, elle est. La pompe, elle fonctionne pas mal de la même façon que toutes les autres, tu sais. C'est juste qu'il y a une insuline différente, parce qu'il faut qu'elle soit un petit peu plus, moins concentrée, vu que ça va directement aussi que c'est supposé, sinon euh, ça pourrait, tu sais, faire du dommage ish, là, je sais. Si on parle d'aujourd'hui où je suis rendue avec ma relation avec l'insuline, euh, c'est sûr que je la déteste plus autant, mais c'est sûr que j'ai encore un doute derrière la tête qui est comme « ok, mais c'est quand, quand la prochaine fois que tu vas commencer à, à réagir encore? » Mais je pense maintenant aussi c'est plus une question... Je pense plus que j'ai autant de haine envers l'insuline, mais plus envers mon corps. T'sais, je ne peux pas blâmer l'insuline dans le fond pour quelque chose que mon corps réagit à, tu sais. C'est pas de sa faute, c'est la mienne. Je pense que les gens devraient savoir que il y a pas, il y a, tu sais, il y a pas un diabète comme les autres non plus. Tu sais, oui, il y a différents types, comme je disais tantôt, il y a le type 2 qui est souvent plus chez les personnes âgées ou les personnes un petit peu plus obèses ou des choses comme ça. Puis as le type 1 qui est vraiment quelque chose qui est euh, hors de ton contrôle, si je pourrais dire. Mais aussi que de diabète type 1 à un autre diabète type 1, on n'a pas le même diabète. C'est d'une façon, oui, il y a le même titre, mais tu vis avec le diabète type 1 de ta façon, puis je le vis avec la, de ma façon, tu sais, d'une façon. Ce que je dirais à quelqu'un qui pense que la recherche en diabète, c'est pas aussi important parce qu'il y a l'insuline, c'est l'insuline, c'est pas un remède. Tu sais, c'est oui, c'est une solution, mais c'est pas une, tu sais, c'est à court terme, là, si je le dirais d'une façon. C'est pas, pas quelque chose que du jour au lendemain, tu sais, je prends par exemple les gens que la leucémie des choses comme ça, on pose toujours, plus, on, on se pose tout le temps plus à trouver une autre solution, une meilleure solution, ok? Tu sais, oui, il y a la solution, mais tu peux perdre tes cheveux, tu sais, avec les médicaments et tout ça, fait on veut chercher d'autres choses. C'est la même chose, je pense, pour l'insuline, c'est que oui, c'est une solution, puis ok, comme tu t'as donné, puis es capable de vivre, mais s'il y a quelque chose plus loin qui pourrait aller vraiment régler le problème, pourquoi qu'on le ferait pas non plus?
All right, that was, it's quite a, a, a last video to come and end this series because, you know, the, the insulin uh, 100 commemoration is all about the discovery of insulin and how we're reading the stories of early patients whose lives were very short. And, and you know, when Sasha talks about how she wouldn't eat and how her blood sugars would, would skyrocket and, and then drop and we are commemorating so much how insulin has solved that, that this kind of really bookends this project and saying that it isn't a cure. So uh, that's quite uh, powerful and a powerful end, I think, to the series that you've done a wonderful job creating, by the way. I just I want to put that out there. That's very, very good content. And I'm, I'm proud that we're able to showcase that on the Defining Moments uh, Canada website. It was, it was great to create those resources. Uh, I mean, one of the things that we also kind of talked about, you and I together, was like, you know, um, making it clear to people, you know, what it's like to be diabetic and what is it like to live with being insulin dependent. And I'm glad that we were able to create this series to kind of give a, a larger swath of what it's like. Clearly, like, like Sasa just, just said, you know, um, no two diabetic is the same. No two diabetic live through diabetes the same way. I think it's important to kind of share those lived experiences so that some people don't feel like they're on their own um, going through things like that, um, especially Sasha's case where it's so rare and so um, unique that, you know, it's should someone else feel the same way about insulin. It's great that, you know, there's, there's a resource out there to help them kind of understand what it's like to live through it. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to putting this video up on the website and sharing it. That's not Maybe for a couple more days, we'll be doing that. This was kind of a avant-première uh, premiere for, for the attendees of the webinar and for the, the kind of the special occasion. But um, thank you for letting us premiere it, Vincent. Thank you for your time and for answering these questions. I think you've, you've done a great job kind of bringing important points uh, up. So thank you for that. Um, thank you. Thanks. And so we've talked, we're just talking now about kind of the discovery of, of insulin being the discovery of something that's not exactly a cure, but that has changed life for so many people. And in fact, over the last hundred years has made it so that except for rare cases like Sasha, people can live a fairly normal life through it. Now, this all began with the story a hundred years ago and, and, and actually more than that, years before that of the discovery, the co-discovery of insulin, uh, the creation, the purification of the extract uh, so we have with us Scott Smalley, who is the creator of the award-winning uh, story map, the Banting story map that's on the Defining Moments Canada website. Uh, it's been recognized as Esri Canada's app of the month in September. It's been a very, very popular aspect on the website, a, a huge part of the Insulin 100 commemoration. Um, and we've in, uh, invited Scott today to come talk to us a bit about uh, the story that he discovered, kind of Frederick Banting's story and the story of that discovery of insulin. So Scott, if you could give us in a, in a few minutes kind of a, a breakdown of, of what is that story that you discovered and that you are telling in that story map? Yeah, so it was really interesting when, uh, when I was tasked with um, beginning that exhibit, it kind of was like, I really didn't know what I was getting into. I knew that there were buildings named after Sir Frederick Banting. Um, I knew he, you know, was the uh, discoverer, co-discoverer uh, of insulin, um, but beyond that, didn't really know much. And so, you know, when I started on that path of doing the work at, you know, um, getting into the archives and, and reading up about Banting and, you know, it really helped to, to shape my understanding of like, uh, of exactly who Frederick Banting was, uh, the importance of the work that he did. And um, yeah, so it was really, it was really a lot of fun to, you know, take all of those elements of his life because he was, you know, his life was so diversified. Um, you know, the story of insulin is really just, uh, you know, as much as it's probably the largest part of his, of his life and certainly, you know, what made him famous. There was so much to, to Fred Banting that, um, that people don't know, that people didn't know. And so, you know, in, in, in mounting this, that exhibit to the, uh, you know, to the story map platform, it was just, uh, it really was the, 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 the ideal place to put it because, you know, the, uh, the, the story map platform really just allows us to sort of differentiate, um, you know, the, the, actual, the actual written narrative with, uh, you know, using maps and adding in, you know, other primary, uh, you know, primary artifacts, uh, you know, letters that he wrote, um, you know, images of those who were close to him. And to sort of bring them all together into one place and um, 
and to really kind of compartmentalize those things um, so that they're digest digestible for the reader. Um, and so I'm just gonna share my screen for a sec. I have just a couple of screen grabs from the, um, the exhibit itself, um, just to save on some bandwidth. So I wasn't gonna show the actual exhibit, but. So yeah, it starts out here where, you know, um, it's, I believe they call this a collection, the platform, but it's basically the landing page. It's a, it is a collection of all of the uh, different elements of the, of the story map. So, you know, um, intro and acknowledgements and then Banting's life before insulin, you know, what informed his decision to become a doctor, uh, the discovery of insulin, which talks about, you know, more about, uh, you know, it talks about Banting the person with regards to that, that, uh, you know, summer of 2021. Uh, Banting the artist, um, you know, he was uh, very influenced by the group of seven um, and he was with, that's E.Y. Jackson on the left. Um, and uh, they went to the Arctic and they, you know, they, they, they went on a lot of adventures around Ontario, Quebec, the Arctic, um, painting and sketching and then Banting Beyond Insulin. So his later research and, um, you know, his, uh, his influence on the Second World War and actually um, the research that, that he did um, towards uh, aviation in World War II as well. So he did quite a bit with his life. Um, and then, yeah, you can see the kind of elements of the uh, of the story map. So, you know, the, you have the defining moments banner on the top. Um, it's, it's broken down really nicely in the sense that you still see the, uh, you know, the chapters up, up top, um, but then, uh, you know, it kind of breaks it down even further and compartmentalizes each chapter. So early life, education, First World War, et cetera. Um, and then, yeah, so, um, you know, the great thing about it is you can see the map on the right. Um, if I can't do it right now because I don't have the interactivity, but you can click on those map points that are there and actually you can bring up things like, um, you know, you can add in uh, images and, and um, additional content uh, re re relevant to uh, that particular, those particular map points. In this case, we're seeing uh, New Tecumseh and uh, the Banting Homestead, uh, et cetera. But um, yeah, it was a great opportunity just, you know, to on the left, you can see just throw some, uh, you know, some a key quote there to kind of draw the reader in and then uh, we continue on. But the map's really cool because you can kind of like, you know, right now you can see at a specific distance, but you can change that distance and you can actually have the map snap to certain points. So you can kind of maybe have a, you know, show all of Canada and then it snaps to maybe Ontario. And so you can kind of see that interactivity and it really helps guide the reader through that process of, of understanding what's going on. And then, as you can see, yeah, you can throw in primary uh, primary sources. We see a, a letter from Banting to his mother. He wrote with his left hand because uh, his his right arm was uh, uh, had shrapnel in it. And you can see that little drawing in the middle of the page on the right is actually he drove through the the shape of the shrapnel that went through his arm. So, um, yeah, kind of interesting. And then uh, and then yeah, some additional interactivity. So when he went up to the Arctic, um, it actually was well documented uh, where exactly the ship that he was on. Uh, where it went, and so in terms of this art, uh, this uh, exhibit, um, you can actually see the exact route, um, the onward and return uh, voyage. And again, click on each part, each uh, part, and tells you a little bit more about about those individual stops. And it's quite interesting. So yeah, it's really just a great, it's a great opportunity, you know, especially if you know for you know if there are educators who want to build you know this this content into the curriculum and what have you. Like it really, you know, the the platform really allows for that kind of differentiation of learning styles. You know, you have the narrative elements, but you also have the, uh, the visual with the cartography and uh, with primary sources. Awesome. Um, like, it, it, I, I found it really interesting to see like, what you're showing, the diversity of sources that are on there. And you're talking about different learning styles that allow you to kind of have different ways into the story. Uh, could you maybe tell me a bit about what about Banting's story is worth telling? Because uh, it's interesting to see, you know, you, you've developed a tool that allows us to tell the story to many different people who learn differently. But why tell this story? Why is it interesting? Yeah, I think that especially as we reach, you know, we're at the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. So, I mean, it's obviously an important story to tell, um, you know, from a, you know, from a Canadian perspective. I mean, Banting is and was and is one of the most important Canadians to have ever lived, probably. Um, but in some ways, you know, we have these kind of nationalist narratives of history and these kind of, you know, these kind of nationalist understandings of who Banting was, Sir Frederick Banting. And in fact, Frederick Banting hated being referred to as Sir Frederick. I mean, he hated it. Um, and he really was, he really tried to shy away from the media. He didn't like all the attention. He was very, very committed to what he 
did as a practice and he had very high expectations of himself. He was very hard on himself, um, but he had those expectations of others. So he wasn't going to do anything he didn't expect others or he wasn't going to expect other people to do anything he wouldn't do himself. So, um, you know, he's kind of a very, very interesting person. So, um, you know, moving away from those national narratives in this in this particular exhibit, we can get to know sort of the real Fred Banting. Um, and, and, you know, some of the things that he experienced were, you know, in his life were, were traumatic. I mean, you know, you kind of read, you can read, you can look at these sources and kind of um, derive meaning from, from them a little bit. You know, we're kind of in a fortunate place where we can apply sort of a modern lens to our interpretation of, of history. Like, you know, people say, well, you know, I, you know, people come back from war and they have shell shock or soldiers fatigue or whatever it's called and or what a battle fatigue and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, we can look at like we can, you know, better understand what that is, you know, PTSD. And it, I throughout the course of my research, I, I did I sort of concluded for myself that I think Banting probably did suffer from PTSD. He was very devoted to helping his troops. He was a medic. He was a medical uh, like he was a he was a medical what are they called? Doctor, uh, you know, on the field or whatever. And he uh, insisted on helping out even after he was injured. So he was just very dedicated. And, you know, he saw he saw a lot. He saw a lot of really gruesome things. And, you know, he came back from the war with the habits in drinking, smoking, swearing. And, you know, at the, you know, in the earliest earlier 20th century, and we're talking about a guy in Banting who, you know, he grew up with these kind of Victorian values, rural Ontario, Victorian values. And he grew up at the end of the 19th century and he entered in you know his adulthood into a, into a you know, 20th century that was you know kind of becoming more progressive and so there were some things that were at, a, at odds socially with banting and what and, and and also you know as i said the experience that he had in the war so he kind of he struggled a bit um with that and he was kind of very impulsive i mean he almost wasn't going to he almost wasn't going to do the research i mean he just was very sort of upset living in london his he wasn't sure where his life was going and so he was very insecure um, and so he, in, on the eve of doing his research in Toronto, he actually um, had an opportunity to be a medical officer on a, on a voyage, I think for the Indian Army or something like that. And he actually flipped a coin to see if he was either going to go to Toronto and do his insulin research or, uh, you know, be a medical officer on an expedition. And, and fortunately, well, actually, the reality was he actually, the coin toss indicated that he was going to go on the expedition, but fortunately, they didn't, they decided to go without a medical officer. So he he did his, his insulin and I think we can all be pretty grateful that that happened. I love how you're you're talking about these kind of this national figure and how you're kind of removing the the frou-frou of celebration of how he's one of the greatest Canadians and really getting down to who he was and why he did certain things. Uh, I love how the story map does that and how you've explained it. It shows how purposefully you went into this. Um, I'm asking you a question, kind of a similar question I asked to Vincent, but Vincent was looking at, you know, legacy of insulin today. And I wanted to know how his research and his video, his videos that he made uh, changed his relationship with, influ with, with insulin. Uh, you're doing kind of, you've done historical research of the discovery of insulin and of the discoverer, the co-discoverer of insulin. Um, how has that affected your view of insulin, of its legacy, of its importance? Did you have a relationship with with it before, and how is it now? Yeah, like my family, like I, I have a couple of people in my family that uh, that have diabetes, and you know, for me, it was just, oh yeah, people take insulin, and it's just dealt with, and this and that. And even that video we just watched, I mean, it shows that you know the kind of complicated relationship to insulin that some people have, right? Their individual lived lived experience of it. And, you know, for me, I mean, I, it just wasn't really a thing. I just understood it to be, you know, diabetics take insulin. But, you know, I think that one of the, you know, one of the most important things to remember is just how significant that discovery was and is, you know, uh, in the exhibit, it's, uh, you know, it's written that, uh, you know, uh, after the discovery of insulin, you know, countless lives were saved immediately after immediately after the discovery and, and for generations since. And I think that's something that, you know, we can't, we can't, um, we have to be respectful of the, of the absolute impact of that. We're not just talking about Canadian patients. We're talking about people around the world. You know, there are some people who wouldn't have been able to, there are some people who would have died in Banting's time uh, and who did die, right? And before, before the discovery, but, you know, even since, I mean, there's people who exist now who would never be, even on this call, I'm sure, who, who, who wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for Banting's contribution, um, you know? So I think that the, the biggest takeaway is just, you know, we have to keep, 
you know, we have to keep this um, discovery and, and the importance of this, um, the importance of the history alive and continue to talk about it, you know, especially in, in these days, you know, where there's, you know, in some, in some cases, skepticism about, you know, medical science and stuff like that, you know, I think it's really important to be mindful of the history of public, of public health, um, the importance of, of public health measures. And so I think this is a very relevant story today as, as, as relevant as it was 100 years ago. Absolutely. We're so used to, to insulin being prevalent and, and being available, especially in our country here, that sometimes we forget about the impact that it had when it was discovered, uh, how life-changing it was for so many people. Um, well, thanks for bringing back, that back into perspective, because I think you know, we try to have a project where we're commemorating insulin from all different angles and we want to keep it, you know, historical and legacy and kind of have a good balance for it. And I think you've done a great job kind of bringing back that historical content and the, the weight of this discovery back for us. And, and of course, of dis describing and explaining the story map and how as a tool uh, it helps tell this story. So thank you. Thank you for being with us and taking the time to talk about that, Scott. My pleasure. Um, and, you know, a good segue here, because you're just talking about the, you know, the historical elements that we have, we have the legacy elements, and we've got uh, the story map as a tool, we've talked about the insulin profile videos as, as a tool. Uh, our last panelist here that we have is Anna England, who uh, is a colleague of mine at Defining Moments Canada. Uh, and she's here to talk to us about the Insulin 100 commemoration, the Insulin 100 project as a whole and the resources that we have available, the resources we have on the website to help people tell the story. So Anna, if you could just kind of take it away and tell us about all these things that were all these goodies on the website. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank you a lot to Scott and Vincent before I start for just helping us create a lot of the really amazing content we have for Insulin 100. Um, the story map and the videos are obviously um, very enticing for our audience and I think people are really, really liking them. So. Um, thank you again. That, that content is just remarkable and looks so great. Um, so I just, uh, as Louis had mentioned, I just kind of want to walk everyone through our website and let everyone know essentially what we have created and what we have curated uh, for the Insulin 100 commemoration and just kind of give people a little bit of a walk through to the website um, just so you can find some of those amazing resources, including the story map and the videos as well. Let's quickly share the screen there. Okay, move this. So this is the uh, Defining Moments uh, main landing page. The Insulin 100 project can be located here. Um, so essentially what we've done here is through the work of people like Scott and people like Vincent, as well as Dr. Ruddy and John Lawrence and a lot of community collaborators, um, we've essentially compiled and curated uh, the one-stop shop you would need, I guess, to learn about insulin and the history of the discovery and the development of insulin. So on our main landing page, you'll find a little bit of a write-up about our project here and some more details about that, as well as our in commemorating Insulin 100 video. And then here along the sidebar, um, you'll find essentially the list of all of our content for the Insulin 100 commemoration. It starts here with uh, Manufacturing Hope. So Manufacturing Hope is essentially uh, an article written by a very close colleague of ours, John Loring. Um, and it was originally published in the February and March 2021 issue of Canada's History Magazine. So that kind of really kicked us off with, with the Insulin 100 commemoration. And you can find that entire article written here. Um, or if you would like to go out and, of course, buy the, um, the Canada's History Magazine, that's always an option as well. Um, and then below that, we, of course, have uh, Scott's amazing Sir Frederick Banting story map. So if you do want to click on that, you can go into the story map and see it all laid out um, in more detail and click on some of those icons. I would open that page now, but because it is a bit of a load, uh, I would be sitting here for a little while. So I'll let, uh, I'll let Scott be the teaser and people can go in and click and find that themselves. Um, below the story map there, we have teaching about insulin. So essentially with this website here, or with this web page, sorry, here, we've essentially compiled everything you'll need as an educator or as a student, or even as a, just an independent researcher that you'll need to essentially learn about or teach about insulin. Um, we've essentially uh, given you, uh, given our audience uh, five lesson plans, which are designed to help students um, sequentially explore issues and develop materials that will contribute to the construction of their own compelling story. 
Um, these lessons also contain individual learning challenges, uh, as well as tasks which can be made, which can be exerted and applied across disciplines to foster critical uh, and curatorial thinking. Uh, these resources also foster connection, uh, connection building uh, across subject lines. Uh, and encourages students to think beyond historical impacts of diabetes and insulin and kind of a, uh, approach it with more of a transdisciplinary approach. You'll also find on the educational resources page, some of our other educational resources also related to insulin, but just more just for students and teachers. We've got um, the seven sentence story structures so that kind of helps uh, students create a narrative in a compelling way and ask the who, what, where, why, when kind of questions as well as more creating great stories, um, and then just a more in-depth uh, look at what curatorial thinking actually means and how to apply that. We also have a lot of online uh, and local resources as well, which you can look at, um, which will help you look at insulin um, through the resources provided through other organizations, other heritage organizations and education resources as well. Um, and then at the bottom, of course, we've got teaching what up some of our other cross projects. So if we just go back to the insulin 100 page there, so right below um, the teaching about insulin, we've got uh, our very, very compelling uh, insulin timeline. So this timeline is supported and created um, primarily with a series of scholarly articles written by uh, the eminent health historian, Dr. Christopher Reddy. Um, so a lot of these are just snippets taken from some of the articles he has written, um, compiled with primary sources, uh, videos, uh, photographs, quotations, and it just essentially takes you through a walk, uh, step-by-step -step chronology of how the discovery of insulin really took place and what different things were happening on different days. So you can kind of plot that along and see what was happening on this day in history in terms of the discovery of insulin. So right below that, We've got the Insulin 100 video profile. So those are the videos that Vincent and uh, Louis helped create for us. So those will have uh, the video from Sasha as well as Vincent's video and the other interview videos that we've included there. So if you uh, really like Sasha's video and you wanna see the longer version of it, Louis will be putting that up in a few days. So you'll be able to see that. And then you'll also be able to see the longer version of some of the other videos that we featured on our social media pages as well. Um, we have also worked with educators um, to help develop a series of prompt questions about those videos. So should you wanna show those videos to classrooms, you'll also have a list of uh, prompt questions to go with those videos to kind of give to your students and ask um, them to ask the deeper questions and kind of look more into the, the content and the context of those videos. So below the video profile page, we have the micros history page. Um, at Defining Moments Canada, we of course like to focus on the, the big definitional moments in Canadian history, but through that, we also like to look at the micro histories and the seldom shared stories that are also a huge part of these monumental moments in history. So although we do like to look at the Bantings and the Bests and the McLeod and the Collips, we also like to look at some of the, the untold stories as well. So in the micro histories page, we have some of the smaller stories related to the discovery of insulin. These ones here, uh, I myself have written. Um, and that looks at the early patient stories here, um, Dr. Lillian Chase, Dr. Gladys Boyd, and uh, of course the newest addition, Sadie Garrence, who's um, considered to be Banting's right hand through the thick and the thin of it all. Uh, below that, of course, we also have um, the lasting legacy of insulin. So these are uh, sequential articles written by um, Dr. Christopher Reddy again. Uh, these have been in collaboration with the University of Toronto. And essentially, Dr. Le Dr. Reddy has um, gone through and looked at some of these, the, the lesser known um, legacy stories as well. And then as well, looked at a more deep dive of Best and McLeod and Collip as well. And as well as some of the institutional histories of some of the buildings that you know to be named after Banting and named after Best. So he looks at the, the lasting legacy of insulin, not only of the individuals, but also of the, the product itself. And then at the end of that page as well, we have uh, trail Trailblazing Women. So these are profiles that were created by the excellent Benin Hederi. Uh, she was a York University uh, uh, public history student who joined our team 
um, when the summer of last year and helped us essentially create these profiles on early Canadian women in STEM. Um, although some of these don't actually have to do with the story of insulin necessarily, they are very, very closely linked to scientific and medical developments around the same time of insulin. Um, and at the same time, we do have Ananya Banerjee, who is a contemporary doctor who's working with um, minority communities across Canada and dealing with insulin and access to insulin. And then as well, also, of course, uh, Henry de Ball Banting, who is uh, related to Banting, but not necessarily the story of insulin. We also have Carrie Derrick, uh, Leon Farrell, and Maud Menton as well. Um, these profiles will be added to in the coming months and years. So that was the, the start of it. And we're just going to kind of keep going with those amazing profiles of some of those women. So below the micro histories page, we have the legacy stories page. Um, so these are just essentially sharing the, the uh, impactful contemporary stories of those living with diabetes today. Um, a lot of these have been shared with us through our partners and our collaborators. So the first one we have here is um, from Camp Hero. We've got the video series here, uh, also written in conjunction with the videos that Vaisa and Louis have done. So these are the write-ups to go with that. Um, below that, we have the Camp Huronda stories. Uh, so Camp Huron is the only camp facility known owned by Diabetes Canada and the only camp of its kind to operate a full summer, um, a full summer program specifically for young people with diabetes. So there's a lot of amazing stories here written by people with diabetes who attended the camp and kind of had the opportunity to reflect on uh, their lifetime with diabetes and, and just connecting with others in, in a similar circumstance. Below that we have the Diabetes Canada stories. Um, so Diabetes Canada works tirelessly to advocate for and support Canadians living with diabetes um, by providing helpful resources, education, research, and more. Um, and they, of course, also operate the D-Camps, which help support facilities um, like Camp Huronda above. We also have contributions from JDRF. Um, so that's the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, which is the leading global organization funding type 1 diabetes research. And their mission is to accelerate life-changing breakthrough to cure, prevent, and treat type 1 diabetes and its complications. And then to finish out that page, of course, we have our personal reflections, which are submitted to us through community members like everyone out there watching us now. Um, so anyone who has found out about the Insulin 100 project and feels particularly compelled by it and particularly connected to it, they send us emails and they ask if we, they can contribute something. And we are more than happy to include those stories. So whenever people are connected to a project that we have on the go, um, they are more than welcome to reach out to us and we will try to incorporate their story if they feel a personal connectedness in some way. So below the legacy stories, of course, we have the glossaries page and that's just essentially terminology that will help you kind of um, navigate your way through some of these more complex topics of, of insulin and diabetes as well. And then we have our partners page. Um, and essentially those are contributions from our partners um, and just current things that they are doing with the Insulin 100 commemoration as well. Um, so of that list, we have the University of Toronto, the Insulin 100 project. Um, again, the University of Toronto archives, which have been um, monumentally helpful to people like myself and Scott and I'm sure Chris Reddy as well. Uh, and then as well as Snonofi Pasture, Canada. Again, very, very helpful resource and a great partner to be with. Um, and then Connaught, Connaught Laboratories, uh, Banting House Museum, a national historic site, uh, and that is hosting an event as well next week. And then, of course, Novo Nordesk, who uh, you see mentioned quite frequently in the story of the discovery of insulin as well. And then just to finish out here, we've got um, the Life and Times of Frederick Banting podcast. So this podcast here um, captures the work of a Banting family historian, that's Bob Banting, uh, who, has who has dedicated a large part of his retirement activities to gathering data, conducting interviews, and collecting family memories, all related to his relative, Sir Frederick Banting. Uh, him and his son, Jim, have allowed us to host a few of the episodes of their podcast on our website. Um, and each of those episodes has also been um, paired with a explanatory article also written by Dr. Chris Reddy. Um, so if you want to listen to some of those podcasts written or conducted by a Banting family member with supporting art articles by Chris Reddy, this is also a fantastic page to go to, just have a podcast to listen to again along your day. 
And then the last thing on our website here is, well, I've mentioned them several times, but now so we can get a good look at them. This is a list of the Dr. Christopher Ruddy articles. So Dr. For, Dr. Christopher Ruddy is of course, um, a very prominent uh, insulin historian and banting historian. He uh, learned a lot from Michael Bliss, who was the foremost banting historian and has kind of picked up the torch for him. So Dr. Christopher Ruddy has, has very generously written for us several, several articles, which really looks into a deep, deep dive into the history of insulin and the early development. So if you are at all interested in that history and a very detailed history, this is a very worthwhile page for you to go visit. Um, and that is essentially the Insulin 100 project page at a very, very quick walkthrough. Our website will be going under, undergoing a bit of a change in the winter months. So expect the format to change slightly come, this, come the new year. Um, but all of these content will still be up and still be available. Um, and we are just so thrilled and excited to share that with everyone um, and let everyone get as invested and involved in the history of the discovery of insulin. I'll pass it back to you, Louis. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Anna, for going through all of that because like you say, we're so excited to share all this stuff and we're, we've got so much good content, but we wanna make sure people know where it is and how to find it. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned the partners page because we do wanna thank all the partners that, that are partnering with us to allow us to do this. Uh, and you've mentioned a lot of articles by Dr. Ruddy. Uh, I do want to give a personal thanks to Christopher Reddy, who's attending right now. So I know he, he's watching and I want to say thank you for all that stuff that's on there. A lot of the content that we have, or all the content that we have wouldn't be possible without the great partners that we have. So um, I want to thank you, Anna, for showing all that stuff. Thank you as a Defining Moments Canada co-worker uh, and, and thank all the partners that we have. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's in attendance also. Uh, for taking the time to, to spend an hour with us and, and learn about our project. And take the time again to thank Vincent, who's had to, to step away, but for his time today and for his creation of the video series. Uh, and Scott, last but not least, thank you for taking the time for being with us, for creating this incredible resource that you've, that you've made uh, and for sharing, sharing your thoughts with us uh, today. So thank you, everyone. Um, and... Uh, have a good rest of your, your good weekend coming up and diabetes week coming up. Take the time to read a few of the resources, watch a few of the videos uh, and share them if you can. Thank you.